Hello, welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ. We are going through the Bible in this class, and we appreciate you so much for joining us and being with us from week to week. Tonight, we are on lesson number 70, and we just entered into the New Testament last week on lesson 69, and we introduced Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the first four chapters, and we saw that Matthew is very interested in showing that Jesus fulfilled Old Testament Scripture. Tonight, we're going to look at some of the greatest doctrine, the teaching of Jesus Christ in his Sermon on the Mount. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to study your Bible and to be exposed to these great teachings, these principles that will help make us better and glorify your name. Help us as we study the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us. And as we are into Matthew, we're seeing that Jesus is, he loves Old Testament Scripture. He fulfilled Old Testament Scripture. You see, the Bible teaches that when we transgress the law of God, that's called sin. Sin is the transgression of God's law. So the Old Testament scripture gave the law of God. Jesus never transgressed any of it. He was sinless. Now, he loves Old Testament scripture. He even used Old Testament scripture in his defense against Satan, as we saw last week when Satan came and tempted him. He said, no, Satan, I will not do that because it is written. But here's what Jesus knew about Old Testament Scripture. It's Pepsi. P-E-P-S-I. The Old Testament is a physical example portraying spiritual intention. Paul said so by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter number 15, verse number 4. Let me read that to you. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, that's the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that we, through patience, and listen, comfort of the Scripture, might have hope. The Old Testament Scripture brings us to Jesus, who is our hope, to the New Testament a spiritual encounter with God. And that's what Jesus knew. And so when he goes to the mountain to give his doctrine, to give his teaching, he is keenly aware that he is going to bring people from the physical to the spiritual. He sees out of the crowd that has come to hear him preach this awesome sermon, the greatest sermon ever recorded. He sees the rich people out there, but he also sees poor people, very poor. He sees sick people, but he also sees very healthy people. He sees educated and non-educated. He sees some religious people, and then he sees sinners, people that are harlots and people that are doing all sorts of evil things in this world. And as he looks out over this diverse crowd, there's something that he knows that he can change all of their lives. He can bring them to fulfilling lives, lives that prepare them for an eternal life in heaven. But he also knows not all of them are going to get it. This message that he's about to deliver on the Sermon on the Mount is going to go right over the heads of most of them. But there are a few that will get it. A few that will be inspired by these doctrines, these teachings. Now, who are these people that will get it? Well, he starts off his sermon. Blessed. That means happy. I can change your lives with these principles. Happy are you if you're poor in spirit. You recognize your spiritual poverty. He says, if you have the ability to mourn 
to be sorry of your spiritual condition. That you're meek. That you hunger and thirst after righteousness. You starve for what's right. If you have the capacity to be merciful and you have a pure heart and you are peacemakers, happy are you people. Why? Because you are spiritual thinkers. The majority of you out there are here for one reason or the other. Maybe you're here for a healing because you're concerned about physical things, your physical health your physical eyes, your ears, whatever it may be, if you're deaf or you're blind. Some of you are just curious. What's all the fuss about? Everybody's talking about this Jesus character that's going around the country preaching and teaching and even healing. And all you're curious, that's all you care about is the physical nature of his ministry. Some of you, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders, are just here to catch Jesus in a, a lie which he'll never lie, and they'll never catch him in his doctrine to discredit him, but that's all they're there about, for physical power of their own. And Jesus is aware that most of you out there in this Sermon on the Mount, listening to it, just will not get it. And it's the same true today. When people hear these truths of Jesus Christ, it's going to go right over their head. They're going to look at it and say, that's not practical. That's not real. That won't work in the real world. Why? Why are they thinking that? Because they're physically minded. And they think like the world thinks. Jesus is saying, happy are you if you're spiritually minded. Because I can change your lives. I can save you from this world of sin and darkness. In fact, you people will embrace the doctrines found in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll be willing to be persecuted. In fact, happy are you when people say all manner of evil against you and they persecute you. In fact, you people are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, he goes on to tell them in this sermon. You people are the hope of the world because when you do good works, compassion, forgiveness, and people in the world see that, some of them will scoff at it and not only scoff, but maybe persecute you for it. Others will say, you know, they have something that I want. You're feeding salt, which is preservativeness. You're preserving their lives, preserving their, their spiritual condition, and you're shedding light into their dark lives. And they'll glorify the Father, which is in heaven, when they see your good works. Jesus is calling these spiritually minded people to listen because he's offering them a new way. Now, he is clear, quick to say, I'm not here to destroy the old law. A lot of people thought he was. These Pharisees, Sadducees, these religious leaders, all oh, he's came to this earth to to transgress and destroy the old law. No, he just never transgressed. He fulfilled the old law spiritually. And he made it clear in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19, I've not come to destroy the old law. I've come to fulfill it. I've come to bring fullness to it, to its ultimate intention. You see, the old law is a physical example portraying a spiritual intention. And I've come to bring it to that ultimate intention. The rest of this sermon, we're going to look at six R words. If you're taking notes, hope you are. Write six R's on your paper, and we will fill them in with a particular R word as we go through. Let's begin. The first R word is relationships. In this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to open up by talking about how he could help us with the right relationships. This is found in Matthew 5, verses 20 through 
48, the first section of his Sermon on the Mount. He starts out by saying, you've heard it said of old time. That's physical now. But I say unto you something spiritual. That's the contrast that we're going to see all the way through the Sermon on the Mount. Physical versus spiritual. And you've heard it said in physical ways. But I say unto you, I'm offering you a new way. I'm offering you new relationships. Because in the Old Testament, you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. That's a relationship that you have with other human beings. Just don't kill them. But I say unto you, I'm going to raise the bar from that physical of don't kill people to a spiritual level. What? Don't even hate people. Don't be angry with people. Because hate and anger can lead to the physical act of murder and killing. But I'm raising the bar. I want you to think spiritually. He said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Don't do that physical act of committing adultery. But I say unto you, I'm going to offer you a new way, a spiritual way. What? Don't even lust. When you look on a woman, don't even lust in your heart. Because he knows that what is inside spiritually will come out physically if you don't deal with it on a spiritual level. He says, you've heard it said in the old physical testament, what? If you want to divorce your wife, you've got to give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, I'm going to raise the bar from that physical to spiritual. Don't divorce. Now, if your wife or your spouse, they uh, commit adultery, he gives them that exception. But he's saying you need to think on a spiritual level that you stay with your spouse. Don't divorce your spouse. And then, you've heard it said in the old physical testament, what? Perform the Lord your oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all. You see, they had come up with an elaborate scheme of lying. That's right. They would make an oath under the Old Testament and swear by this and swear by that. But in reality, they were figuring out a ways around it. Here's what little children would do in our time. They would tell you something. I promise you I'll do this. I give you my word. I give you my oath. And then they would break it. And then you would say, well, wait a minute. You promised. And they said, no, I had my fingers crossed. That means if I have my fingers crossed when I gave you my word, then I don't have to keep the word. Oh, they were coming up with all sorts of a web of things. Oh, if you swear by this, then you're bound. But if you swear by that, you're really not bound. You see how they did that. So Jesus said, look, that's all physical. That's physically minded. Let me share with you a spiritually minded way to approach your relationships with people when you give them your word. What? Yet you, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. He goes on to say, you've heard it said in the old way, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, evil for evil. If somebody does you wrong, do them back. But I say something spiritual. Don't rely on your relationship with people in that physical way to get even with them. No. Spiritually minded people will turn the other cheek. They will go the extra mile. If somebody asks them for their uh, coat, they'll give them their cloak also. Only spiritual-minded people can do that. But that is a new way. That is a better way. You've heard it said in the Old Testament, in the physical example of the way people have relationship with each other. What? To love your uh, friends and hate your enemies. <laughs> but I say unto you, love your enemies. What? I can't do that. Well, if you can't do that, then you're a physical-minded person. And it's time to start thinking spiritual. Become like Jesus and be able to say, Father, 
Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Only spiritually minded people can, can grow into that action. The next R word that we're looking at is religion. Now, Jesus is moving from your relationships, instead of having physical-minded relationships with people, have spiritual-minded relationships with people. Now I want to look at your religion. I don't want you to have a physically-minded religion. I want you to have a spiritually-minded religion. And this is found in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 18. And here's how he puts it. Scribes. Pharisees, hypocrites is what you are. You guys are doing things on a physical-minded way when it comes to your worship, your religion. And he breaks them down into three, giving and praying and fasting. He starts out with giving. He said, you people give to be seen of men. When you do your alms, and alms means you're giving. When you give, you just want everybody to look at how good you are, how generous you are. Ah, you have your reward when you give to be seen of men. That's a physically minded approach. But I'm offering you a better approach, a new approach, a more fulfilling approach. What is it? The right religion, the spiritually minded religion. What? Don't tell anybody what you give. Keep it a secret. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. And then when you give, it's on a spiritual plane. And when you pray, oh, you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you love to pray standing in the marketplace or on the corner of the street so that you can be seen of men, how holy you are. That is a physically minded approach to religion. No, I say unto you, Jesus said, I'm bringing you up to a spiritually minded approach. What? Go in your closet, and there, God, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. Now, during that uh, part of teaching on prayer, he, gave, he gives the model prayer. We often call that the Lord's Prayer, and it's found in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13, and I'll just uh, take a moment to outline that prayer for us. He says, here's how you pray. Start out with worship. Look at verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's a spiritually minded person praising and worshiping God. Open your prayers, your religious prayers, by praising and worshiping God. Then, in verse number 10, thy kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And of course, God's will in heaven is ultimately done. And, and I pray that your will will be done on earth too. That's submission. So start off our prayers by, by praising God and then move into submitting to God. That's a spiritually minded prayer for sure. And then he goes on to say in verse number 11, give us this day our daily bread. We realize that we do have physical needs, but our physical needs are given to us, supplied to us by spiritual God. God, you are behind all the good blessings. Our spiritually minded people say, God, you give me my physical needs. Most physically minded people say, well, I've got bread on my table because I went to work last week. I made a good deal. I made a good sale. And that gives me money, and therefore all of my physical needs are met because of what I physically did. No, a spiritually minded person says, no, God, you are the source of my physical needs. And then in verse number 12, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Repentance, move into repentance. A spiritually minded person understands that they are poor in spirit, and they mourn over that spiritual poverty. And they pour out to God confession and repentance. And, verse number 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. They ask God, spiritually minded people too, 
for spiritual protection. Lead us not into, the te into temptation. Deliver us from evil. That's asking for uh, protection from God, spiritual protection. But then they go on to finish their prayer by saying, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever. Worship. They opened in worship. Hallowed be thy name. They closed in worship. You have all the kingdom, power, and glory. Jesus goes on in his uh, part of this sermon with religion, talking about fasting. When you're uh, in the physical mind, you put uh, dust on your face and ashes and wear clothes that are rent and torn and you're sitting in sackcloth, they call them, in ashes to show people that I'm fasting, I'm religious. Jesus said, no, that's a physical way to approach your religion. When you fast, wash your face, comb your hair, wear nice clothes, that you may not appear unto men to be fasting, so that God, who sees in secret, shall reward you open. Now, is fasting a part of our uh, religious practice today? Perhaps we should think more seriously about fasting, because giving is part of it. Prayer is part of it. We're not fasting. Study that for yourself, and maybe we'll do a little bit more study on it when we get into what Paul did during his spiritual experiences in life. But the next R word, the next part of the Sermon on the Mount, and the R word is resources. It's the third R word. We've already looked at relationships. We've already looked at your religion. Now we're going to See what God wants you to do with your resources. Not physical, but spiritual is how he wants you to approach your resources in life. What does he say? Jesus says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's physical. That's what physically minded people do. Instead, put your treasure in heaven. That's spiritual. And that's what spiritually minded people do. You cannot serve two masters. You will either serve God or you'll serve mammon. And that word mammon simply means money. You will serve God, who is spiritual, or you will serve money, which is physical. You've got to choose. Are you going to be physically minded or are you going to be spiritually minded? So don't worry about the physically minded things of this world. Don't worry about your life, what you will drink, what you will wear, what you will uh, eat. All these things, God knows you have need of these physical things, but a physically minded person consumes themselves with these physical things. No, don't do that. You need these physical things, that's for sure. You live in a, a physical body, but trust God to provide these physical things. God will take care of you. He takes care of the birds of the air. Uh, he takes care of the grass. In the field, he'll certainly take care of his children. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these physical things will be added to you. The fourth R word is reasoning. How do you think? How do you reason? Is it physical or is it spiritual? Well, he begins this section, which is found in Chapter number 7, verses 1 through 12, don't judge. Now, I want to be clear with this. When somebody says, well, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to make it a judgment call. No, he's not talking about discernment. We need to be discerning. We have to look at things and say, well, I discern that this is good. I discern that this is evil. He's going to say, cast not your pearls before swine. Well, you've got to discern who's the swine before you don't cast your pearls before them. So he's not talking about discernment. We all need to discern properly, spiritually, righteously. What he's talking about when he says judge means condemnation. Don't pronounce judgment. Don't pronounce a condemnation on someone. The Pharisees, who are physically minded, for sure, that's all they were doing. They were pronouncing condemnation on people at every turn. 
They were looking at the moat or the speck in their brother's eye while they had a beam or a log in their own eye. Jesus is saying that's a physically minded person indeed. A spiritually minded person will take care of themselves, get the, the beam out of their own eye, and then they can see clearly to help their brother when the need be. Then he goes on to say, ask, and it shall be given you. You see, people who are spiritually minded seek spiritual things. That's what they ask for. God, give me understanding. Give me knowledge. Give me uh, peace. That's what we're to ask for. We're asking God into his will. What do you, God, want for me? That's a spiritual thinker. Now, physically minded people will say, okay, ask and it'll be given to me. Well, give me a million dollars. Give me perfect relationships. Give me everything that I ask for physically. Well, that's what physical minded people do. And they certainly don't need to expect that God will give, give them a million dollars. That's not what God is, is teaching us in this Sermon on the Mount. Ask for spiritual growth. Now, we may need some physical things in our life, some resources to be able to uh, glorify God in a spiritual way. Ask for these things because you're asking for them to glorify God into his will. You're praying into his will. You're asking into his will. James chapter number four, verse number three says, if you ask to consume it upon your own lusts, that means physically, then let not that man think that he'll receive anything from God. Don't expect that. God gives good things to folks, that's for sure, both spiritually and physically. So be like God and uh, give to others of your physical so that you can help them spiritually. Follow the golden rule. Now, we know what the golden rule is. He, he quotes it here. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is people who think or reason, there's our R word, in a spiritual way. People who think or reason in a physical way, they don't apply the golden rule. They apply the iron rule. Do unto others as they do it to you. Evil for evil. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, right? But spiritually minded people can reason and think in a different way, a better way, new way. What? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In the next R word, which is found in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 27, we're going to use the R word resolution. Resolution means what you resolve to do, your choices. We're about to enter a brand new year. Some people will make New Year's resolutions. I know I will. I always like to think about what choices do I want to make to help the next year to be better? What am I resolved to do? What am I want to make up my mind to do? Well, I could say I'm going to be physically minded next year. I'm going to think about ways that I can, in my relationships with people, in my religion, uh, in all of these ways that we've been talking about, I'm going to just continue to be physically minded. Or I can say, I want to be like God. He is a spirit, and I want to be thinking like God. I want to think like Jesus. I want to become like Jesus. I want to become more spiritual, and I want to worship God in spirit and in truth. Well, there's only two ways. The physical, which leads to death, and then there's the spiritual, which leads to life. There is no other way. And he gives several examples to show that in this section of his Sermon on the Mount as he completes it. He starts out with saying there's the straight and narrow, 
versus the broad and wide. Something that is straight, that doesn't mean that it's from point A to point B is a straight line. No, straight there means it's difficult and it's narrow, hard to stay on track. That spiritual-minded people want to follow that way. They got to have discipline to do that. They got to watch. They got to be careful. They got to think spiritually. Because thinking physically is what most people do, and it's so easy to do, but it's a broad way, easy to walk, and wide gate, just easy to go into. Don't think physically, think spiritually. It's a little bit more difficult, quite a bit more difficult. And there's the sheep versus the wolves. And you know the difference between those two creatures. The sheep are spiritual. The wolves are physical. Then there's the good tree versus the corrupt tree. We certainly want to be the good tree, producing good fruit, which is next. Good fruit versus corrupt fruit. Then he used the illustration, those that do God's will versus those that just say, Lord, Lord. I don't get it. Physically minded people think that all you got to do is physically say, Lord, Lord. Just say a prayer. Just, just call God's name and, and physically do this and everything will be well. No, no. We certainly must do those physical things. But the spiritually minded person is the one that does the will of God. That doesn't just say, Lord, Lord, but goes out and accomplishes what God wants him to accomplish. Not for physical deserving of salvation, but to glorify our Father and to obey his will. And he summed it up by giving an illustration. Our young people do this in vacation Bible school. Who built his rock, uh, house upon a rock? The wise man. Who built his house upon a sand? The foolish man. And they sing that song. The wise man built his house upon a rock. And the foolish man built his house upon the sand. There's only two ways. Spiritually minded people build their house on a rock. And the rock, of course, is Jesus Christ. The truth of the gospel. Foolish minded people are physically minded people that everything they build their house on is sandy foundation it'll it'll all go away the car that you have it's gone in a few years the house that you own it will belong to somebody else and the land will just another person on an abstract someday all these physical things will all be gone they're fleeting they're they're just finite but spiritually minded people build their house, lay up their treasures in heaven on, on the rock of the truth of Jesus Christ, and they're wise in doing so. They're spiritually minded. And in this life, it's the best way to live. Because when the rains come and the winds blow, what's going to happen to the house that is built on the sand, on physical things? You'll fall flat. Because they, they don't offer any real joy any real security. But those of us who are spiritually minded and have built our house upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ and his truth and his gospel, when the winds come and the winds and the rain descends, we will not fall. We will stand firm. So we want to end up by saying what was said about that Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. And we're going to use the sixth R word, real. This is real. This works. You know, when people who are physically minded look back at the Sermon on the Mount and they say, well, you know, your relationships, that doesn't work that way. That's the first R word that we had. The second R word, the religion, how you approach religious things. That doesn't work that way. That's not real. That doesn't uh, matter. And then the people who uh, use that third R word of resources, no, my resources is for me. Or that fourth one, the reasoning. That's not the way to think. 
you, you shouldn't think the way that Jesus said think in this uh, particular sermon on the mount. And your resolutions, choices between two, straight and narrow, wide and broad, uh, sheep versus wool, uh, that's, there's so many more choices. That's not the only two choices. Yes, it is. Spiritual and physical. That's it. And the people who see that can see the reality of that, the truth of that. And here's what the people said after that wonderful Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. They said this, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were, listen, astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. This teaching astonishes spiritually minded people. Physically minded people, it goes in one ear and right out the other and they count it as foolishness. Are you spiritually minded? Are you physically minded? Let's decide. Let's make a resolution to become more spiritually minded, more like Jesus. Next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up there in our journey through the Bible in Matthew chapter number 8. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to read together about the Sermon on the Mount, these principles that Jesus uh, taught us and help us to be more spiritually minded every day so that we can bring you glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord willing, we'll see you next week.